Hello, Kevin Griffin. Hello, Lilo. Nice to see you. Nice to see nice you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I, I'm excited to be speaking with you directly because you are a pretty innovative Buddhist, I would say. Um, and you speak a lot about the addiction and how to recover from addiction. Um, so I'm very interested about your story and, and hearing more about it, and I'm sure it'll inspire many. So is this related? Is, is, is your... How did you find out or how did you discover Buddhism? Is that directly related to your addiction that you had to go through and recover from? Um, not really. I, you know, I started uh, studying Buddhism before I got sober. And I, in a way, I was trying to use uh, meditation as some kind of a way of solving my problems, I guess, without without really knowing what my problems were. Uh -huh. So uh, I, uh, I, in some ways, I think I was trying to use meditation as a drug, right. which people do sometimes, you know, if they think they can have some special experience, then um, the meditation can, you can think it's an escape. So, uh, but I was drawn to Buddhist teachings. They just seemed very authentic to me. And eventually, I realized that without giving up the drugs and alcohol, that the Buddhism wasn't really going to help me. Right. That I needed, I needed that foundation um, in sobriety. And once I got sober, then my meditation started to work better, I'll say. You know? uh, and it started to be more of an integrated experience. It wasn't just this separate spirit kind of spiritual thing I was doing that was separate from who I really was. It, it became much more um, of an integrated part of my life. Yeah, and a, and a more, I, think, I guess, authentic meditation. Otherwise, your mind was always somewhere else, I guess. Right. Well, I mean, my mind is always somewhere else anyway, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the, you know, when you're there's a way in which drinking and using um, kind of breaks your ability to uh, to just see clearly. Yeah, I mean, as you say, I mean, your mind is somewhere else, definitely. And it's not not even you don't even have to be high every minute. But when you regularly do that to your consciousness, I think it affects your ability just to develop. Uh, any kind of wisdom or insight, you you kind of stay. Uh, it 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 um, kind of sh um, cuts off your ability to grow uh, both emotionally and spiritually. You know, a lot of people say that when you start to drink and use, that's when your emotional growth stops. So a lot of people, like me, who start when they're a teenager, by the time you're in your mid thirties and you get sober, you're still emotionally. A teenager. Mm -hmm. So, how would you define addiction then? Ah, uh, well, addiction. Uh, you know, I th I think of it uh, first of all as something that damages you, that you feel compelled to do. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it, there's a there's a sense of compulsion. But it's not just, I mean, there's lots of things like I feel compelled to brush my teeth every day, but I don't call that an addiction because it doesn't harm me. So it's got to have a harmful aspect to it. And then there's this com compulsion or obsession mm -hmm. tied up with it where you don't feel as if you can stop. So we're out of control. It feels as if we're out of control. And certainly at times, I guess we are, it's... It's kind of difficult to define yeah. what control is anyway. Yeah, but, but it, so how can we, so how can we, what do you suggest as to healing those addictions? Well, I mean, the way I got sober is through the 12 steps and, and working with a program. Um, and that's certainly the most common way that people deal with it. A lot, I, a lot of people go into treatment centers. The thing is that the, the biggest uh, issue in a lot of ways is just acknowledging that there is a problem coming out of denial. 
seeing that clearly, once you see that, then there's a possibility for change. But I, I know I didn't really acknowledge or even recognize that the drugs and alcohol were my problem. You know, I thought everything else was the problem. Mm -hmm. That the people in my mm -hmm. life or my work or, you know, the, my diet, you know, I was always looking for the, in the wrong places for the answers. So it's really, I, I, don't, I don't know that I can advise people how to deal with their addiction. They, you know, it's something people have to solve for themselves in a certain way. I mean, at the, at the beginning, I mean, I help people I consider my work to be more about maintaining recovery and growing in recovery. Not so, but that crossing the line from addiction into being clean is it's something that's very personal. And you can't, you know, people will write to me about their kids or their spouse or someone who's got an addiction and saying, you know, what can I do to help them? And to a great extent, there's not much we can do to, to get other people to get sober. You know, they have to kind of see the problem for themselves. So, I mean, the best thing we can do for other people is to not help them it, to, or to not enable them mm -hmm. in any way. But it feels like we're so all addicted. We're, we're, we're all addicted. All of us, it feels like we're addicted to something or another. And we feel trapped in our life. We feel imprisoned. We feel separated from. And I'm sure you, through the extent that you went through, you know, with such an addiction, there's probably some application of it that could be really inspiring and useful for all of us. That's what I'm trying to get to. Okay. That's a good place to get to. So what you're really talking about now is the heart of Buddhist teaching, okay. which is the idea that we, that what causes us suffering, and this relates to everybody, not just addicts, is our clinging, is our trying to hold on to things that are, we can't hold on to. And the, the, the kind of the core of that, of the, those addictions, is our holding on to identity or holding on to ego. So that's the place that Buddhism really points us to, to really watch the place, things that grab us, that we hold on to. So, and, and, the, and as I say, the most seductive of these is identity. So when we believe that we are somebody or that we are solid, there's a solid self, then we're trying to hold on to something that doesn't have any solid existence and so we naturally are in this kind of constant struggle to keep recreating ourselves to cre keep recreating our identity so we could say that in meditation what we're doing moment to moment is letting go of self letting go of creating the self moment by moment so this is really what the the practice of buddhist meditation is about Wa sitting there and watching watching your mind and watching how you create ideas about your future, about your past, about who you are, about what you should do, what you shouldn't do. All these ideas that are reinforcing something that ultimately doesn't have any substance. And as we see that, then when we let go, just moment by moment, there's a moment of freedom each time we let go. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think is the or addiction. And we can see it just the way we're addicted to thinking. <laughs> right? So each time you catch yourself just having the mind spinning and going off, blah, 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 blah. When you catch that and can just simply breathe or just be present to whatever is happening, whatever is in front of you, whatever you're experiencing, and let go of the story in the mind. Right there is a moment of freedom. And that's, yeah, that's letting go of that addiction. Mm -hmm. So do you think, in Buddhist term, is the, is, are we reincarnating each time with those similar ad addictions or like a soul or w would have, a, would have some, something to solve on this planet ongoingly after addiction? Like you have, you, I mean, what is the belief around reincarnation and addiction related to, and from the, the Buddhist view, point of view? You know, well, first of all, I'm not familiar with the Buddha ever 
the Buddha himself actually talking about addiction per se. I mean, his teachings seem to point to that, but I don't know that, you know, at that time there was so much that concept of addiction. So, so I don't... Or it, attachment, I, I can't, should say. So those attachments, yeah, there are similar yeah. patterns from a lifetime to another and some things that we have to deal with in our karma. Well, that is a good question. I, I don't know. I don't, um, I mean, first of all, obviously the Buddha talked about reincarnation and probably strictly speaking from a traditional Buddhist viewpoint, what you're saying makes sense that, that there's some kind of attachment that keeps reinventing itself from lifetime to lifetime. But I, I have to say that I'm not uh, that traditional or in my beliefs in Buddhism. I, I, I don't believe in reincarnation and I don't not believe in reincarnation. I just don't know because I do, I've never experienced it consciously. So, um, so I don't like to make a, I don't want to make a pronouncement about, yeah, if you're an addict, it's because you've been an addict in so many lifetimes. What I can say is that in each moment, we are recreating ourselves. We are re reborn each moment, whether there's previous actual lifetimes, I don't know, but I do know that addiction is definitely created moment by moment, and the way you end addiction is moment by moment right. stopping. Doing, well, the, the, stopping. The, 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 the funny thing is that we have all a tendency to use the past or even previous lives as an excuse to not be in the present moment and dealing with what really needed to be dealt with in that moment, thought by thought, what you're saying. Right. So, well, that's right. That's, that's a trap. That's the that's risk. That's a trap. That's the risk. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that, that is, and that that's a trap. And it's, you know, if since we don't know about our past lives, one of the things the Buddha said is, about reincarnation is that you, if, or well, really about karma, but the same thing, right? About our our karma is that if you try to solve it, if you try to go back and unravel it. You know that you're actually just going to make yourself crazy. That it's that that's not helpful. That what's helpful is to pay attention right now, because the only moment when you can change your karma is this present moment. You can't change what's happened in the past. You can't change what's happened in the future. The only thing you can change is what's happening right now. So, but whether you know, however we got here. We can't do anything about it. All we can do right now is try to be awake, aware, to act skillfully, mindfully, lovingly, wisely, you know, mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. And those yeah. practices, what you're saying too is that it's a regular practice is needed. It's not one time here, one time there, but it's, it's on a regular basis. Absolutely. And this is certainly what's difficult for many people, but, but to me... And it's much like recovery, you know, going to meetings and staying sober really requires an ongoing commitment. And certainly for meditation to be really meaningful or transforming, it has to be a regular part of our lives. If we just meditate when we feel like it, we're probably not going to be meditating when we need to. You know, it's not always pleasant and working with the difficult and working... Uh, you know, with the challenges, is what really allows you to grow. It's, it's, um, t for me, it's just, it's life, you know, and being awake, mm -hmm. and, and mindfulness and meditation, it's like reminding myself what's important. You know, what's really important is my inner life, and my spiritual life. And if I don't put time into that, if I don't have a commitment to that, then I'm not really living the life that, that's most important and that's most meaningful. Mm. You're talking also a lot about the listening from a meditative state. Can you tell us more about that? Well, let me just say that <laughs> as I, I kind of talk about the opposite, which is not the opposite, but, that, but for me... 
I think it's equally important to try to practice mindfulness in all our activities. Like when I'm talking to someone on Skype, you know, to try to be mindful and thoughtful and careful in this moment, not just when I'm in a meditative, concentrated state. Mm -hmm. The, you know, and it, it's, we could say that, you know, the, I mean, there's no, I can't really say why we meditate exactly, but one of the reasons to meditate is to train yourself to be more mindful in all your act, other activities. So it's not like this specialized action that's separate from everything, mm -hmm. but it's really something that I want it to blend in with who I am and how I act. In meditation, though, it's a time when I'm able to uh, shut I'll shut everything out in the in the uh, in the um, sensory way. In other words, closing my eyes mm -hmm. and separating myself from the world, but learn to, it's like practicing being alive. So uh, I sit there with my eyes closed and because I'm not doing anything else, I can start to notice the things that appear in my mind very clearly. When I start to notice them, then I'm starting to realize what my habitual way of being is. The things that arise in meditation are the same things that arise in regular life. So it's not something unique or different. It's just that I'm watching them more carefully. And I'm starting to, it's like studying yourself. It's one of the ways that we can characterize meditation. Studying yourself so that when you get to know yourself very well, when those things appear in the mind in daily life, you can remember, oh, there's that one. That's trying to get me to go off. You know, that's trying to seduce me. Let me just come back. Let me be present. Um, watching the mind is probably the most interesting thing you can do because mm -hmm. what, what is more interesting than the human mind? So, but that so, state of meditation, you, you, you can be in that state while listening to somebody like right now, listen, literally when you're listening or when I'm listening, I can be in a meditative state and I can be also that even when I speak. Yes. So we have to, we have to distinguish different levels of meditation. So uh, l l let me just talk about uh, the, two, the two aspects of meditation that are key are mindfulness, which is the quality of just being present. And that's something I can do as I'm speaking to you, as I'm taking a walk, as I'm eating a meal. And the other aspect is concentration. Now, concentration is much harder to maintain and really requires and depends upon more stillness and silence. So I can't get to that deep meditative state when I'm just in a normal situation because that there's too much activity. Mm -hmm. But I can get to that mindful state. I can be present and, and awake and mindful in any activity. The thing is, that's hard to do because concentration really makes it easier to be mindful. So you have to really have a strong motivation, a strong intention um, to be present, to, to maintain that in daily life. And this is the great challenge. You know, I'll say that when, when I started meditating 30 years ago, what was mostly taught was concentration. And the, the medit people would go on meditation retreats and have these experiences, as I did, but when they would go home, they wouldn't take anything really with them of it, you know. They'd still, me you'd still meditate during the once a day or twice a day, but the rest of the time there wasn't much mindfulness. Nowadays, I find that teachers, and certainly I emphasize this, we emphasize mindfulness in our daily lives as much as sitting meditation and as much as retreats. Because if we're not taking those insights and those experiences into our lives, then it's just this thing that's separate and it's not that useful or meaningful mm -hmm. do you believe that there's a certain amount of time that needs to be meditated for 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 change or a shift in frequency or for being in a certain phase i mean is there is there like 
30 minutes and then if you go to two hours a day for example that's going to make a huge difference i mean is there some kind of time you know timeline yeah I, well there there is yeah there is and but i think it's i before i tell people you should meditate for a certain period of time i like to say just get on your cushion and whether it's for a minute just do that you know, so so that because because if you say, well, you've got to meditate for half an hour, or it's not worth it, then people will use that as an excuse to not do it. Mm-hmm. No, I don't have enough time. So uh, the first thing is to just sit down and do it. Now, uh, then you do discover that there are different points, and twenty minutes is a typical period of time that, and I think the studies are showing this too, some of the brain scans, that after 20 minutes you drop into some deeper states. And the, I don't know all the mm-hmm. terminology for the mind states. The but neuroscience points at that, yeah. Yeah, but, and then but you'll discover though that if you go on a meditation retreat, mm-hmm. that after a couple of days you'll have a, a deepening of your meditation you really, after two or three days, there's very often a real shift. But I've also found that if I'm on a long retreat, yeah. that after two weeks, yeah. there's something that happens. So who knows? You know, people go on three year retreats. Maybe there's something that happens after a year, you know. So there's no doubt that the amount of time you put in has a direct relationship to the transformation that's yeah. happened. Yeah. yeah. Because the lamas do that for three years, and they are they supposed to go on a three-year retreat, and then they're capable of teaching uh, people meditation only then. Yeah, that's right. The uh, that's in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, which that's not my, ah. you know, my practice. So I'm, I'm not that experienced with it, but but I, ha- I do understand exactly what you said. That it's a three-year, three-month, three-day retreat, and after that time, you can take on the name of la- a lama. That those retreats, though I understand, have more of a study component to them. The retreats that I go on are silent meditation retreats, where there really isn't any study. You have basically sitting meditation, walking meditation, and everything else is meditation. When you're you'll meet with a teacher every couple days, and maybe you'll hear a talk every day or so. Mm -hmm. But other than that, you're in complete silence. And the purpose of that is to develop very deep concentration. So the, the, the concentration really depends on the silence. But what, what I want to also say in regard to this, uh, yeah. just, to, uh, just so people aren't confused, is that when you go on a long retreat, like I've gone on a three-month retreat, that's the longest retreat I've been on, you don't just keep getting deeper and deeper and deeper. You start to go through ups and downs. Uh, because it's just the nature of the mind that it doesn't stay steady you you know you'll settle in but then in any given day you'll have periods of more calm and periods of more agitation and it's just going to be like that and then something will happen and you'll get upset you know and you'll and it'll seem like you lost it and then you'll settle back down and then it might seem like oh i'm just getting so deep i'm you know nothing could ever shake me and then there'll be a noise, and you'll get, you know, oh, no, what, what was that? You know, and so it's, it's not that there's this constant deepening, oh, wow, you just go deeper and deeper. I wish, you know. Mm. But I always wondered, and I cannot stop to wonder if there is a, 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 a now quicker ways to connect than meditation itself, or if we really need to sit yeah. down for hours and hours, knowing that some people say that the energy and everything is more accessible these days, so... I'm just wondering if there is some new kind of quick meditation or it's just not possible. You just have to spend the time. Uh, I don't know of any, but, (laughs) you know, I'll say that people sometimes get powerful experiences, usually through being in the presence of some kind of a master. And when you're around someone like that, you can get the feeling of a deep meditation, but it doesn't stay with you, I don't think, in the same way that it does when you develop it on your own. Of course, yeah. So, you know, I think you can get a taste of it. And, and you know, this is what people were taking LSD for in the 60s, right. yeah, this was, was to was get say. that spiritual, yeah, I mean, it was to get that spiritual experience just instantly, you know, and 
And then you, you want know, to go back to it once you have experienced it once, then you, you're seeking that for the rest of your life. Right. And, you know, if you realize, as somebody like Ram Dass did, he realized, oh, well, LSD isn't the real thing. I need to get the real thing. That's great. But if you think that it's through the drug, that's how you become an addict, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, I think that's, we're always looking for shortcuts, but it's hard to get a shortcut when we're dealing with the, the mind, those mind states. Yeah. Well, very interesting, Kevin. Thank you so much for spending this time with, yeah. you know, with me and with all of us watching, and, and thank you. My pleasure. Well, really enjoyed it. Great meeting you.